Welcome to the Collectability Podcast. It is a great pleasure and honor today to have the opportunity to interview the one and only Madam Eveline Genta. Today, we are going to ask some very interesting questions and hear some extraordinary stories. And I would like to start with a quick biography, and then we'll get right to the interview. One of the great watchmaking partnerships of the modern era was between the artist and watch designer, Gerald Genta, and his wife, Evelyn Genta. Married for 33 years, the couple were a true team, and she played a significant role in some of the most important periods of design in modern watchmaking history. Equally impressive is her own distinguished diplomatic career. Since 2011, Her Excellency, Madame Evelyn Genta, has held the prestigious position as the ambassador, Monaco Embassy to the United Kingdom. Born in Monaco, she was educated in London at the French Lycée and has lived in London for the past 15 years. Between 1983 and 1999, Evelyn and her husband ran the watch brand Gerald Genta. During this exciting and extremely innovative period, Evelyn managed two factories in Switzerland with 250 employees while developing new markets in Asia, Europe, and the Middle East. This spring, Sotheby's is auctioning off a selection of Gerald Genta's paintings, including his original 1970 painting of the Audemars Piguet Royal Oak and his 1976 painting of the Patek Philippe Nautilus. In total, 100 pieces, personally selected by Madame Genta and her daughter Alexia from his treasure trove of over 3,500 works, will be sold. Importantly, Sotheby's is selling each painting with an NFT which protects authentication and ownership of each painting. The sale is in honor of the 10th anniversary of the death of Gerald Genta, and proceeds of the sale will go to the Gerald Genta Heritage Association, of which Evelyn Genta is president and chairperson. It is a great honor for Collectability to be speaking with Evelyn Genta today and learn more about how she and her daughter approach this special dedication to her husband's art. With that, Madam Genta, welcome to Collectability. Thank you very much, John, for this very glowing introduction. I'm just equally happy to be with you. You are the, the watch specialist, so I hope you're not going to ask me too many tricky questions, but let's get on with it. All right, let's get started. Thank you. As we talk today, the second part of Sotheby's auction of a selection of your husband's artwork is taking place in Hong Kong. It's been 10 years since his passing. In a couple of weeks, he'd be celebrating his 91st birthday. What do you think he'd make of the, this current recognition of his work in the fact that one of his watch designs, the Nautilus, is one of the most sought-after watches on the planet? Thank you very much for that statement. I'll answer you with another statement. A few weeks ago, some people from the Far East came to me and asked to buy all the designs of Gerald Genta, which, as you know, I have got 3,200, which is something I'm not interested in selling. And I said, well, why do you want to buy all his designs? And they had this reply, because it's like buying the Michael Jackson catalog. And knowing Gerald, he would have loved that answer. And he would have found that very funny and would have adored it. But that's what it's about, the celebration of designs. It's about putting Gerald in his rightful place, where the, the, the gentleman who designed the most iconic design of watches of the, the, this last era. Many have said, and I agree completely, 100%, that he is the Picasso of watch design. And, and I think the, the world is finally waking up and understanding this fully. I mean, those are, those, that's a strong comparison. What are your thoughts on that? First of all, I can only love it because Picasso was Gerald's very, very favorite painter. There was not an exhibition of Picasso anywhere that we didn't go to and we would spend hours. He, he, he admired the painter so much and he said people who don't um, when people say, oh, I don't understand these paintings, he said, well, it's like when you don't understand Chinese, learn Chinese, then learn Picasso. 
uh, Gerald, yes, was known as the Picasso of timepieces. And I remember once in Singapore, in Orchard Road, a huge poster of him along a building saying the Picasso of timepieces. And you couldn't have made him happier. It's incredible. I, I think he's uh, smiling upon us knowing that 10 years after he's left us, we're thinking of him and honoring him. I really hope so. With the, the world in its unfortunate state of turmoil, it must be a challenging time for you to be a diplomat. In addition to your role as ambassador to the embassy of Monaco in London, you are the non-resident ambassador to the Republic of Kazakhstan. How do you balance so many high-profile responsibilities while managing the legacy of your husband? The diplomatic side, I have managed for quite a while. I happen to know Kazakhstan extremely well, so that helps because, you know, although it's not close to England, when you have a country you know well, it is easier to develop relationships between our small country and a very big country. And, of course, most of my time is spent in London because I'm mostly ambassador to the UK, which I know and love very much, so that's... The, the legacy of Gerald, I had always sworn to myself that before his 10-year anniversary, I would put Gerald back to where he belonged because I feel, I felt, I don't feel it anymore, but I felt that some brands had forgotten, uh, not all of them, some have been very good, but not all of them had forgotten what they owed to him. And the Swiss watch industry as a whole, as well, what they owe to him. And I made it my mission to just a gentle reminder. And it seems we have got there. Oh, and I'm so pleased to say that. And, and you indeed are a diplomat because there are many watch brands that do not like to talk about the people that the brilliant minds behind not only their designs, but their watchmaking. It's almost uh, been a taboo topic to discuss some of these people in the past. And uh, I'm, I'm trying to be diplomatic myself. And it's such a shame. But now uh, in France, we have a saying which says, you only lend money to the rich. Well, now uh, a lot of brands are remembering that their models were made by Gerald. But some brands are thinking their models were made by Gerald. And I have to say, no, that he didn't make. So it's really quite wonderful. <laughs> Oh, that's great. People are taking credit where it's uh, it's it's not due. Yes, and it's very sweet because you, you know I, he didn't. I think for for those of our listeners that don't realize the breadth of his impact of what brands he was designing for, I'm just going to mention a few. Of course, we know about Audemars Piguet. Of course, we know about Patek Philippe, and these are indeed his designs are the most desirable watches on the planet today. But he also uh, designed the pole router uh, for Universal Genève at the age of 23. He also uh, designed the constellation for Omega, the engineer for IWC, and countless other designs for Piaget, Cartier, Corum, Hermes, and, and more. Are there any brands that uh, really surprise you? when you look at uh, who he worked for? I was at Watches and Wonders about, was it 10 days ago or something? And uh, somebody came up for me and said, I'm from Timex. Your husband designed the watch for Timex that was made 30,000 pieces. I didn't know. He designed for Seiko. I'm, I'm telling you the most unu the more unusual brand, Seiko, and, and uh, really loved, absolutely adored his time with Seiko. He designed for um, Van Cleef and Arbels, for Fred, for Graf, of course, as you said, for Cartier, for Hermès. For, uh, it was endless. Let's talk about Seiko, and let's talk about your meetings with Mr. Shinji Hattori at Seiko and how he changed your your life and, and the legacy of Genta. Absolutely. Uh, Gerard has always had a great love for Japan, always. The delicacy, the interest for detail, which is very Japanese. And so he designed a very special uh, watch for Seiko, and they invited him to come over to their shop, which was their luxury shop where they sold brands. Waco, correct? 
Exactly. Um, when he went there, he, um, Seiko had a poster uh, saying, you know, from the gentleman who designed the water load, the Nautilus, the this, the that, and the other. And some of these brands, I won't tell you which one, actually phoned Seiko and complained and said, you cannot put that on the poster. And Mr. Hattori was so shocked at that, so shocked, that he turned to Jan and he said, this is so unacceptable, Mr. Genta. You need to do your own brand. And she asked, well, how can I put my name on? And they said, you must absolutely make your brand. And that's how it started. So, yeah, he, he was always grateful for this push that the Japanese gave him and the faith they had in him. I find that story so beautiful. It's, it's almost ironic in a way. Uh, after meeting Mr. Hattori a few years ago, he was very interested in the Swiss industry and how he could improve it with a unique Japanese way of doing business, uh, their aesthetic, their perfection. And uh, the fact that he helped propel Gerald Genta to go out on his own is absolutely intriguing to me. It's a full circle storyline. Yeah, and Gerald loved so, uh, Japan so much that, that they've never been seen. But that I have here, he designed a collection of watches that are here, uh, not physically the designs are here, uh, inspired by the belts of samurais and these are very very beautiful watches uh, you know i hope one day they get produced i, I hope so and, and maybe if he listens to this podcast it will happen let's let's hope <laughs> well let's go back in time a, a few years it, your marriage was obviously a match made in heaven personally and professionally with your commercial excellence and his design brilliance in the beginning, how did you two meet? We met at, at a lunch in summer by a pool, and he sat next to me, this guy with his moustache, and uh, I heard he had a Swiss accent, but his first word to me, God, is your watch ugly? And I, I, I thought, I mean, this is not really nice. Who's this mad guy, you know? And I was wearing the watch of quite a famous brand, and he said to me, well, the, can't you see the lugs are the wrong shape and this is not uh, very well done and look at the dark. He, he, he annoyed me so much that I took the watch off and put it in my trousers pocket. And then when I came home, I put the trousers in the washing machine and the watch came out in little bits because watches don't do well in washing machine drawn at all. And uh, I was so annoyed. I phoned my friends and said, you know, this mad Swiss guy you just introduced me is just, I just, lost to watch because of him. So he heard about this, phoned me, and that's how it started. His first words to you were, God, your watch is ugly. Yes. And I thought there was nothing wrong with my watch, you know? <laughs> I hope you could tell me the brand off the record later, because I just need to know. We do know it's not water resistant, though. So that's the only hint that you could offer at this point. So growing up in Monaco and then in the UK, did you ever imagine that you would marry a Swiss Swiss Italian, and spend most of your life traveling the world surrounded by watch design and production? Nothing, nothing at all. No, no way. And, you know, we ended up traveling the world, as you say, one month we would go to Asia and do, you know, Singapore, obviously, Hong Kong, Malaysia, Brunei, and the next month would be the Middle East, and then we would start again. So, yes, we're traveling all over. I could only imagine the dinners that you have had in the stories that you could tell. Tell us about the most extraordinary dinner you've ever had with Mr. Genta. Um, the most extraordinary dinner I've had with Mr. Genta. What I can tell you is, the, is the, I don't know about, it doesn't come to me right now, but what I can tell you is about the most catastrophic meeting with one of my biggest clients with Mr. Genta. Gerald was very aware that who he was. I was, as you said, the commercial side of it. And we had this very, very important client who came up with this idea that he should do scales. You know, when you weigh yourself on just scales, yeah. standard scales. And so he brought a very normal scale and said, like, I want 80 of those in white gold. And I want my feet in pink gold on these. And I want a little clock jargenta on these. And my husband, who didn't speak English, said to me, over my dead body. 
And I looked at the client and said, no, and, and this is a wonderful idea. They were thinking this is a great order. And Gerald walked off in a fury and we're in this huge room. And obviously the client is feeling something is quite not quite right. And he's saying to me, is your husband upset? I said, no, no, not at all. He's delighted. And I said to Gerald, would you please come back? And he said, I'm in front of a Picasso again. You see, a Picasso époque bleue. I'll never see such a beautiful painting again. Leave me alone. At which point I replied, if you don't come straight back, I'll divorce you. But in the end, I didn't divorce him and we never made the scales because he wasn't going to put his name on that. That was the kind of things we did together, which I must say was fun. I'm just picturing those pink gold feet. So many adventures oh, and, and so many relationships. And one of those important relationships that you had was with the, the Tay family, the, the owners of the Hourglass in Singapore. I, I believe they might have even arranged a Malay wedding for you both, in addition to your, your wedding in, in Monaco. Uh, please tell us about that uh, experience. So they came to Monaco, and Mike Tay, I think, was eight years old. You know, to me, the Tays, they're part of my family. They're my Asian family. That, and I just saw Henry again in Watches and Wonders. It was very, very moving for me. But then straight away, we went to do an exhibition in Malaysia. And when we arrived, we were told, okay, tonight uh, we're giving you a Malay wedding. And I thought, this is a joke, you know. So they said, well, you need a white dress, you need all that. And suddenly we were running around KL looking for dresses and things like this. And we arrived to this evening and Jo was given like a sash and I was given eggs for fertilities and they danced on glass. It was absolutely, absolutely beautiful. And they made a sign paper. So I used to say, in fact, I married him twice. Couldn't get rid of him anymore because I had two weddings, you know. And again, Malaysia is somewhere very, very special, which I still go to with great, great joy. Oh, it's such a beautiful country. Let's learn a little bit more about your husband, in particular, his uh, earlier years. I understand he did have a challenging childhood and might have left school at an early age to support his family. How how did he do this and, and, and what happened? He came from a very, very poor background, but really, really poor. You know, um, um, Gerald's father had no money. And uh, and then came the war, and Jean's father was Italian. His mom was Swiss. He had a brother and a sister. And the Swiss decided when the war started that only the Swiss could be allowed to stay, and his father had to leave Switzerland. And, of course, the family didn't want to be broken up. So when he was eight years old, they all left for Italy, where they, they didn't speak the language. And uh, they were surviving on small, small jobs. And when he came back to Switzerland after the war, he, he studied for a little bit, but had to stop at 14 years old to help his mom was going blind. It is, it is a, it's, it's a very Dickens-like story. It's very, very sad. And he did all sort of odd jobs, um, bringing, carrying packets from one place to the other or selling tickets for cinemas or little, little odd jobs, and he had no formal education until he took, um, he learned how to become a jeweler. And Gerald could physically make a ring. I mean, he, he knew how to do that. And he was employed in, um, in a factory for one year, but then Gerald being Gerald couldn't stand having a boss and decided that was it and uh, stopped. So he stopped working with these people at 19 and then had to survive and started designing all sorts of different things, not watches at the beginning, all sorts of things. But because he was in Switzerland, it made sense to go to the watches. But that's how he lived. What an incredible story of success. And on a lighter note, I have to ask about his iconic mustache. Did he have the mustache when you met him for the first time? Yes, yes, yes. And the, the, the mustache was a very big thing, and it was a whole thing. He had to have the tiny, tiny scissors to cut it. I mean, this was a work of art in itself, that mustache. <laughs> For so many reasons, I wish he was still with us. And, and today, with the mustache, back in fashion, very much so. He was always 20 years ahead of his time 
in so many ways. You're right. I hadn't thought of that. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Always. In, in not only his designs, but the way he, that he, he lived and the way that he thought. Uh, he was a futurist in a way. Going back um, to the mid-20th century, he was, as you said, a jeweler by training. And then I believe he worked uh, for some time with Gilbert Albert, another extremely talented jeweler. Uh, can you tell us about that relationship? Absolutely. He he really, in those days, Gilbert Albert was considered very way out and uh, not at all traditional jeweler. And they played together with metal in a, in a colors of metal being putting white and yellow gold and pink gold and engraving it or making it giving it a rough edge which now today is very common in these in these days it, it was quite striking and uh, I, they won together a, a prize de la ville of the city of geneva they were very proud of and, and they were friends i i assume yes yes they were friends absolutely he was friends with quite a few artists he was very Good friend with César, they both enjoyed good food and good wine, you see, so I think that helped the friendship. And uh, Gerald did in precious metal some of the works of César uh, in, 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 in small replicas, you know, for him. Along those lines, this is the most important question that I want our listeners to really think about. You believe it, and I believe it, but I want our listeners to really think about this. And here it is. Would you say that Gerald Genta invented the process of watch design? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Before him, watches were round, square, rectangular, and that was it. And then they would go to the bracelet factory and put a bracelet which suited the watch, they thought. And there was no design was not a thing at all. He really invented that process, like he invented so many things, like the integrated bracelet, like the screws on the on the on the bezel, all of that that seems to us today very, very natural and normal. He invented, he's definitely the first watch designer, definitely. He made the roles of design for for generations. And I even like I'm thinking back in the, the late 90s when I, I started in the auction world. And I would see a Gerald Genta perpetual calendar with the moon phase come up. And I was always just captivated by the moon phase being made out of gold. And this, this iconic look, once again, was about 20 years ahead of the rest of us, that now today we recognize how important this seminal design has become in the watch world. Um, can you talk a little bit about his love of perpetual calendars? Yes, and again, he was so much ahead because today perpetual calendar is a very common thing. I want to talk not just perpetual calendar, but when he started perpetual calendars, 10 years later, when he remade perpetual calendars, because of course that is not a new concept, but when he brought it back, that then everybody started doing uh, perpetual. By that time, he was doing miniature repeaters, and then everybody started doing miniature repeaters. And at that time, he was doing the Grand Sonnerie, and, and, and that happened as well. Then it was the retro, and suddenly everybody rediscovered the retro. And, and this is why I have here designs that are still, that have never been seen, that are still much ahead. As you've seen in the watch world these days, there's a lot of character watches uh, people do. They, they, they're relaunching the Disney's, or they're doing the Marvels, or whatever. I have in my safe the actual that that is an actual watch, a prototype that was made about what twenty years ago of a um, Superman watch, but it's not just Superman on the dial. It's a very interesting case, a very interesting lug, just reminding of Superman. So you see, he was again much much ahead. As for the perpetual calendar, Gerald said the moon and the the, the sky is too important to be just painted on the dyes like they all do. To him, there was no way it could not be in yellow gold and in lapis lazuli. And therefore, the only brand you find this as well is Cartier with the Pasha because it was made by us in our factory. 
So you see that the Cartier Perpetual Calendar Pasha is a cousin, a very close cousin of the Genta. Uh, it's it's so certainly part of uh, part of the family. And and looking at those, we're looking at the early designs. On just looking at the Sotheby's site, you could see the designs and and, and start to understand a bit about his process. And and I think you could answer this better than anyone in the world. What was his process? How did he sit down and sketch and paint? What was his typical day like of of work? Well, I have to take out of what you just said. You said, sit down, sketch, and paint. You can say, sit down and paint. Because in fact, there was no sketch. What he would do, first he would dress up because you didn't design a watch if you were wearing a tie. That was just unthinkable. So he would be dressed and go and sit at his desk. Then he would take his compass and do a circle, do two lines, you know, cutting the circle. And then he would take the paintbrush and paint the watch. There is no sketch. It's all in his head. There's no, no use of pencil before. It goes straight from the compass doing the perfect circle for, for the, let's say, the, the skeleton of the watch to the watch. For such a technical form of artistry, to skip the step of sketching. That is just mind-boggling that these are paintings. And I think people need to remember this when looking at this, this auction. This is artwork. This is not a, a CAD-designed print or sketch. This is a painting. This is a painting done with very, very small paintbrushes. And it's actual total artistry. Total, total artistry. There's, no, there's nothing to do about it. But also... He knew watches so well that when you give a watch to a watchmaker for one of his designs, I had this done for a friend of mine uh, who was very dear, and I wanted to do something very special. So she chose a design that had never been made here, and I brought it to a watch factory. And they never had to call me because the design is so precise that if there is a diamond that is 0.50 or 0.25, it is painted 0.25. The crown is the right size. So every, this is why he's a true designer. Designers can go a bit crazy and design things that are exciting but cannot be manufactured. What's the point? Everything can be manufactured. His designs are so avant-garde, but at the same time so grounded in traditional design it's almost it's it's a, a step forward and backward at the same time but here's here's my question did he ever discuss the divine proportion or the golden ratio it was a bit but more on his radar was the fact that he said the octagon was the perfect circle it was a better circle than than just the round one so he very quickly developed an obsession with the octagon which uh if you look at my wedding ring, for instance, I have an octagon wedding ring. And it, it was later that he discovered that in Asia it was such an important shape. But to him, that was the obsession, the octagonal shape. And that's a great segue to this year being the 50th anniversary of the Royal Oak. Is it true that he designed it in one sitting? Yes, he designed two in one sitting. If you saw the last sale, there was one that started, I don't know what went through his head, he did it like hexagonal, and no, didn't like it, and went straight into the one that you saw. And that was done in one go, and that was it. And he remembered so well these uh, diving suits of his youth, where uh, people were diving into the, the river in Geneva, the Larve, and he saw them being, uh, you know, the, these helmets being screwed on. And uh, he thought that uh, that if, if these guys could trust their lives into these, uh, this is the ultimate watertight uh, feature. And therefore, it's the first time that the screws came on the dime. Now you can see them everywhere. Did Mr. Genta have any commentary on how screws should be lined up within a movement or on a bezel? Did he ever consider that? Absolutely, absolutely. As far as the Royal Oak was concerned, he followed the Royal Oak's manufacturing all the way through. He went to the dial uh, factory, he went to the case factory, he went to the bracelet, he told them how the screw should be totally equidistant, 
uh, he followed it from A, it, it's his baby, you know, he followed it from A to Z. And, uh, and then as far as our own watches are concerned, it was exactly the same thing because he was in the factory every day. So he would go from floor to floor to discuss, to decide this, how this dial should be a bit less blue, a bit different blue. So he loved doing that. You spent many years traveling, as we discussed, uh, throughout the Middle East and Asia and received countless commissions uh, from royalty, some that you can discuss and some I imagine you cannot. There must have been many times you produced uh, or, or Gerald Genta designed a single timepiece that in itself could have become an international bestseller if it was ever scaled up in multiples. And it's it's frustrating, I have to admit, from the watchmaking world that we'll never see some of these designs. Can you give an example of one of these? Yes, I agree with you. For instance, I have a collection of chronographs. At some point, we had a client who was very into chronographs. I've got 250 different shapes of chronographs, and they are so with different dials, the, the ideas, and you're right. Gerald was a manufacturer of prototypes. So because our clients always wanted, the first question to us is, what do you have that's new? So that pushed him forward to constantly produce one-off. And I totally agree, and I even know the ones that would be bestsellers, because he told me himself, he said, you know, this would be a bestseller, that would be a bestseller. But he liked, he was not interested in doing that. If you asked him, oh, is this your favorite watch? He said, no, the next one is my favorite. But, you know, the creativity that, that he did would be so wonderful for all these watchmakers because a watch cannot be just made bigger and bigger and bigger or smaller and smaller and smaller. It, it needs to be, there needs to be creativity. Are there some paintings in your possession that you will never share? Are there some that, that can't for many reasons? Oh, yes. Yeah, you know, I want to ask, can you tell us about them? But I won't. <laughs> At Collectability, we are, of course, focused on all things Patek Philippe. And we have to dig into the Nautilus with you. The story goes that the porthole design of the Nautilus bezel was created in recognition of the Stern family's love of sailing. Can you tell us what it was like for your husband to work with Henri Stern himself and as an as an artist, and uh, any anecdotes you'd like to share? Well, Gerald had a huge, huge uh, respect for the Stern family. To him, they were the ultimate. And uh, when uh, he was in the bar of the Dry König in Basel, the Stern family came in with, with their associate that people worked for them. And he was in a corner thinking, if they asked me, to do them royal oak, because by then people were beginning to grasp the royal oak, what would I do? And uh, because they, they sail and they sailed on the lake as well, you know, they're real from Geneva, uh, he designed a porthole. And um, he went to them and said, would you like that? And they, and they did, because, uh, I mean, he could not speak higher of the Stern family than he ever did, you know. Really, and he was so so happy that the Nautilus became what he was. Henri Stern was first and foremost a sailor, of course, also the, the owner of Patek Philippe, and his his obsession with design. And he also loved to sketch. I'm curious, did you ever see a copy of Henri Stern's sketchbook? They did a, an edition of a thousand copies. Did you ever see that? No, I didn't. Would love to, but no, I didn't. They worked not only closely together, but they were also friends. And uh, Patek Philippe, as we know it today, would not be the same company without Gerald Genta. But he would be happy that it is successful. I mean, to him, Patek Philippe was like God. You know, that was it. What do you think Gerald Genta would think of watch design today? He used to say, how much bigger are they going to go? Because, you know, that was... 10 years ago, and uh, he looked at watches every day, and he said, if we carry on going bigger and bigger and bigger, we're going to end up with the clock of the village church on our wrists. <laughs> and it's true. 
uh, like he when he talked about women ladies watches, there are here a lot of ladies watches. People don't know that very much. He felt that the lady watch should not be a small man's watch. It should be a lady's watch, not just a small size. And he felt that there was not enough creativity and they were just declining the same model over and over again. Of course, for somebody who only made one of each, that was the antithesis, wasn't it? Uh, there's, there's probably quite a logical middle way there. But uh, for him, it was a shame. And uh, and he used to say that quite loudly, which were, which didn't make him very popular. I've been a bit critical in, in the past of how I see the current state of the industry where they take movements and then layer on CAD designs to accommodate the structure of the movement. Where it's almost designed backwards than the way it was in the past. Like a, Gerald Gento would design a watch and then the watchmakers would have to figure it out how to get that look to his his perfect standard. He would. Only one occasion did he do what you said that is backwards when we had the Grand Sonnerie. Because the Grand Sonnerie, as you know, is a thousand pieces. And it was a request from one of our collectors and who asked for a wrist ground sonnery and Gerald said, we can't do that. It took five years to get to that. But when that movement worked, it then had to be dressed, didn't it? And it was quite thick and he didn't want to have a watch that was too thick. So he designed that special case that was like a pyramid because by making it a pyramid, you were breaking the, the height of it. And, you were, and it didn't look, that is the only time when he did what you what you said, go from the movement and dress it. Otherwise, it was always the other way around completely. It's a classic debate of form follows function or should function follow form. <laughs> Let's go back to the, the auction that's happening now. Uh, you started the, the Gerald Genta Heritage Association in 2019. And with this special sale with Sotheby's, you hope to support the foundation. Can you tell us more about the foundation and why it's important to you personally? So the foundation, first, I'll be very honest with you, the, the biggest object of it was to put Gerald back to where he should have been and to tell people who he was. I was actually very surprised that young people knew so much about him. My daughter was on Instagram and all of these things gets requests from people about her dad who are 20 years old, 25 years old, and are they knowledgeable? Uh, very, very surprising. So that was the idea of the heritage. And I thought Gerard would have liked to have a prize to support a designer, not, not a watchmaker, because it is true, and you know that better than me, that movement-wise, the industry is always more and more sophisticated, and they have always brilliant movements, but a designer. So we hope to create a judge enterprise to choose, because I'm not obviously on my own on this uh, committee with other watchmakers, and to support um, a young designer. But one of the requests would be that his design can be manufactured, that they are logical enough that you can wear them, not, you know, crazy ideas. I think his dream is about to come true. <laughs> <laughs> I think what you've done is honors his legacy in a way propels his vision forward for for hopefully generations. It's, it's so exciting. I'd like to ask you a question. After reading the interview that you did with Hodinki, your, your daughter mentioned his musical taste and the type of music that he liked to listen to while designing. Can you comment on that? Yes, he used to listen to this rap. Uh, I can't even remember the name. My daughter remembers the name of that rapper. Uh, because I would have Chopin or Litz and he would switch it off and go for rap music. I mean, Gerard had, had very eclectic tastes. And um, he, he would listen. To, and I said, how can you create with listening to this music? He says, no, this, is, this speaks to me. Okay. Fine. This is why I think he would have loved also the NFT part of it. People are always saying, why are you doing the NFT part of it? Jean was always, always liked something a bit quirky and forward thinking. He would have loved it. Was the NFT angle of as being part of this auction, was that your idea? Where did that come from? Totally my idea. 
I met somebody who's very big in NFTs and I asked him to explain to me what are NFTs. And he, the reply was the non-fungible tokens. I said, well, that's not helping me a lot. And, and then I, I understood. And I thought for us as to who we are, this is perfect. It is perfect because the gentleman, whoever, I don't know why I said gentleman, the person who buys the design, obviously there is the physical design, which is the, that work of art that will be framed. And, but then that can travel with you everywhere on your computer and it's with you. And that's point one. And point two, which to me was really important, is the authenticity. Because once you bought the design physically in your sitting room, but the NFT goes on the blockchain, and the blockchain is forever. And therefore, forever, it is that the design you own is made by Gergenta. There have been so many years when people said, no, no, he didn't design this, he didn't design that. We are selling this design with the authenticity of the NFT, which will be forever in the blockchain. So there is, there is a logic to it. It's not just because it's fashionable, and I don't know how fashionable it is. There is a total logic in it. But of course, you need to have the, the physical piece because that's the beauty of it that you can actually touch, you know? Having a digital twin in NFT form seems completely logical to me. And it raises the question of artist rights and artist royalties. Are there any smart contracts tied to the NFTs in this particular cell? None at all. None. Just a design. A work. It's a work of art you're buying. Can you comment uh, if who made the NFTs? Is that um, is that public? It was all organized by Sotheby's, who well, are very very ahead in that uh, technology. So that part, the, the minting and everything, was done by professionals from from Sotheby's. I absolutely love that you could pay with Bitcoin. Yeah, I got so excited. I mean, I I thought how forward of, of me. I mean, I haven't. I've seen that on an occasional lots, but not in a sale where you could actually pay by Bitcoin. So for our uh, crypto native friends out there, here's your chance. <laughs> the original painting of the Royal Oak sold at auction uh, this past February for an extremely impressive five hundred and sixty four thousand five hundred Swiss francs. And as we speak, the bidding for the Nautilus original painting as of today is at 3.2 million Hong Kong dollars, which is approximately 400,000 uh, US hammer. Are you surprised by these numbers? Yes. Um, when, when we went into this, I had no idea, to be honest. I had no idea. And I decided not to watch it until the end because I couldn't bear the excitement. So I didn't. So you telling me now how where the Nautilus is, I didn't know, right? The Royal Oak, of course, I'm very happy that Audemars bought it, to be honest, because I know they're making a museum. They're extremely, extremely, I was going to say grateful, no, but they, they really respect Gerald very much, Audemars Piguet, and the fact that it's going home to the Brassus, that design, and will be seen by lots of people made me very, very happy. Um, I must say... Uh, I was thrilled. Um, the Nautilus is an even more interesting design because, as you know, a piece comes up and underneath you have got the side of the Nautilus. So it's uh, it's an even more interesting design. It's designed, but it's got an extra part on it. But what I'm also pleased about is that the other designs did well because even though, yes, you talked to me about the work and the Nautilus and I, I'm so happy and thrilled and they're both brand fantastic. A lot of his design did very, very well. And I wanted this, these three auctions to show the versatility. I didn't go for just the best sellers. Otherwise, I could have put different. Uh, I mean, obviously, these two big ones, there were others I could put in. But I wanted people to understand that Gerald could design sports watch, uh, complications, Mickey, ladies watch, jewelry watch, pens. I chose that very, very, very carefully as 92 pieces of art and not just a brand that will make a lot of money. Now, obviously, I am, I know that I've always known that the Nautilus and the, the Royal Oak will be big sellers, but the rest is really uh, in the last sale did very well. And that was really equally important for me. As I was going through the sale, of course, your eye is drawn to the Nautilus. 
but it's the other designs which are relatively affordable. And I personally will be getting my bids in, uh, not for the Nautilus, unfortunately, it's out of my price range, but the, the fact that you can own a painting from Gerald Genta and, and, it, and it goes to promote his legacy is just a, a win-win. And, uh, and I think when many of us uh, see his picture and hear his name from the watch community and beyond, we just have to smile. It's, he brought a lot of pleasure to the world and a lot of uh, happiness. Before we conclude, and I wish we could speak all day because you're so full of wonderful stories, I'd like to share a quote your late husband said. And these are words that, that mean a lot to, to many of us. Quote, if you're not different, you have no right to exist. End quote. That's a very Gerald a definite comment, but it is true. And how different was he? It sums up his creative genius and always challenge, challenge, challenge and think differently. But his constant quest to create new designs and, and also stay ahead of the curve was, was, was at his core. And no doubt the world has lost a, a great artist and will always remember him. And, and we thank you, Madam Genta, so much for sharing your memories of him today. And we're so excited to watch these sales closely. Thank you so much, John. It was lovely talking to you. Thank you for welcoming me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Please, to our listeners, visit Sotheby's.com to see the results and the offerings of the, the third part of this sale, which will be June 8th through the 22nd um, out of New York. And you may have a chance to own one of these incredible Gerald Genta paintings for you and to help promote his legacy at the same time. This was our 14th episode in our Collectability Podcast series. I want to thank you all, all of our guests for listening. And if you enjoyed this podcast, please like and subscribe and follow us on your favorite podcast platform in order not to miss future episodes. Thank you all for listening. This is John Reardon for Collectability. <laughs>